Welcome back to Man vs. Meeple, the show where we talk about all things board game related. Today we're going to bring you a review of a brand new game from Mark Paquin and of course Bruno Catala, one of your favorites, yes. David. This one's called Yamatai. A lot of people are calling this the spiritual successor to Five Tribes. What do you think? Yeah. Well, we'll get that to get to that in our review. I it definitely has some things in common. It does. But it's definitely a different game than Five Tribes. Yeah. I'd say both of those things. Let's talk about all the components. There is a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, I will say it's a very simple game to play though, once mm-hmm. you understand the basic turn structure. So each player will start with a specific number of buildings in front of them. These buildings will scale. You have more buildings with fewer players in the game. Uh, you have a number of actual buildings that you can play onto the map. Now, this map that you're looking at, it has a lot of different sections on it. Each of these areas are considered islands, right. and around the islands you have nodes. Each of these nodes will hold one ship, and progressively through the course of the game, these ships will start to fill out the board as players are placing ships onto the board. Now, the ships in the game, there's five different types of ships. They are communal. Every player shares the same color ships throughout the course of the game. No one owns any different colors, and you'll be building off other players' ships. The ships are ordered by rarity, with green being the least rare and the gold ships being the most rare. Um, There is a player board. Each player will have a player board in front of them. Yeah, the player board is really... Uh, maybe the most beautiful player aid ever. Yeah. Because it really just walks you through the steps of a turn. Yeah, there's no player powers. There's no variable player powers in the game, uh, but it just walks you through all the five different steps that you'll be using. Uh, There are fleet tiles. There's ten fleet tiles in the game. Uh, These are used for a variety of different reasons. One, to acquire ships. Two, to give you a special ability for that turn. And three, to order the turn order for the next round. Uh, five of them will always be face up, and the ones that are used will go to the end of the round, and new ones will slide in. There's money, of course, that you'll be collecting through the course of the game. Money is worth victory points at the end of the game. You have sacred tokens, and you have victory points. Sacred tokens are uh, tiles that you'll be able to use onto the board to block people from building. Yeah, there's a unique power on one of the fleet actions that allows you to sort of like basically block an island. Each of the islands at the start of the game, when uh, you seed the board, you're going to randomly turn over each of these culture tokens. There is a culture token for each of the different islands. Once they are placed here, you'll turn them over. Some of them will leave the culture tokens there. Some of them will have a black border around them, signifying that those culture tokens belong on a mountain, which you'll place under there. Some of them are just flat-out mountains, and some of them have nothing on the backside. Yeah, they'll just go away. Yeah, they're just empty islands at the start of the game. It really sets up a nice variable... Uh, setup for sure. I mean, this game plays very differently depending on how things start out. And then you have specialists, which are aka the genies from (laughs) Five Tribes. These all give you special abilities. There's 18 unique ones, meaning that from game to game, you might not see all of them. You might see all of them, but they have a lot of cool uh, dynamics on how you use all these. They break the rules for the game. Yeah, they break the rules, plus they're keyed very closely to the culture tokens yeah the interesting thing is so many of the different elements of this game like many of bruno's designs have to do with one another Mm -hmm. so everything you do is going to affect something else to begin the game each player will start with uh ten dollars that they'll be able to use to buy uh, ships through the course of the game you're going to randomly seed the fleets at the start and you're going to randomly seed uh the turn order that's the only time in the game that this is all randomly done from this turn on, after the first turn, uh, turn order is determined by the fleet. Right. So we're going to walk you through the game and how it works. Uh, I'll start with the first yeah. action on your turn. Starting with the first player in turn order, they're going to pick one of these fleet tiles. The fleet tiles, as we mentioned, will give you uh, an X number of ships that you'll pull from the common pool and place them onto your board. It will give you a special ability, which you can use right then. Some of the abilities will allow you to build buildings for less, so you'll be able to use those when those actions would take place. And then, of course, at the end of the round, once all players have taken their turn, it will determine the turn order for the following round. So the lower uh, actions that you pick the sooner you'll be able to go, but the less abilities they will typically give you. The number 10 allows you to get three ships. The number one only allows you for a single green ship. So you are determining your turn order by picking this tile. Once that is done, you go into phase two. Yeah, phase two is very simple, and this allows for a little more flexibility. You're going to be acquiring ships, generally speaking, with the fleet actions, but in phase two, you're able to either buy an additional ship or sell an extra ship you have. Uh, Buying additional ship, there's some values here. The green ship being the least rare uh, cost one, Mm -hmm. and the reds cost four. It should be noted yellows 
can't be purchased this way. There's a special specialist that'll allow you to do that, but you can't normally buy yellow. And you can also sell yeah. uh, a ship in this case. Now, why you might want to do that is because you don't want excess ships. You can only hold one extra ship at the end of your turn. Yep. Uh, any more than that gets wasted, but you're going to take penalty points for that uh, down the road. Yep. So selling some ships can often make the difference there. Plus, gives you some money. And reminder that you can only do one or the other. You're either buying or you're selling, right. not both. Third uh, action on the, on the uh, turn, you'll actually get to place the ships that you've taken. Uh, when you place those ships, there's a variety of different rules that you need to be aware of. The first rule is, at any time, on any blank space that is on the border of the board, on the left-hand board of the board, you can place your ship no matter what. That's a free action. You can do it uh, without any kind of rules or regulations. However, if you place adjacent to a ship that is already in play, you have to follow the same color of the ship that's right. already been played. So in this instance, I have two greens. My very first ship has to be a green. Every ship that you place after that, there's two rules you have to follow. Number one, it can be any color ship you want. Number two, it has to be coming off of the last ship that you yeah, place. Yeah, basically you need to continue the string that you've started. Yeah. At no time will you ever be placing your ship out in the middle of this board by yep. itself. That's right. Uh, there is some manipulation that goes on, but you have to either place in the starting position or continue a string that already exists. Each time that you place a ship, you're allowed to take one of two actions, not both. The first action is you can require a culture token that is connected to the island of the ship that you just placed. So in this case, I place a green, and I can take this culture token and place it on my side of the board. The other action you could take, you can build a building instead of taking a culture token. What you need to do is look at the island that it's connected to and see if any of these buildings make sense. In this case, this requires two greens and one brown, and I have two greens and one brown, signifying that I can place one of my buildings into that location. Right, and what's cool about this is you don't have to be the one that places the two greens and the brown. And this, this is very much a game about building off the work of all of your opponents whenever possible. So in that case, Jeremy completed that. You're, you're constantly looking at those buildings over there, gauging the board to see where you can build certain things, and then, you know, directing your turns that accordingly uh when you build there's a couple different things that happen the building that you uh have built gets placed face down on your side of the table that will give you victory points at the end of the game and there are three different kinds of things that can happen when you build a building the first thing that happens if it is the second building that you build in a location you're going to get money according to how many buildings that you have adjacent or in that string. So in this case, if I built this blue, I would get $2. The next one that I built, if it's adjacent, I get 3 and so forth through right. the course of the game. If you build on an island, or on, I'm sorry, on a mountaintop that is cleared, you will get one victory point. If you build adjacent to one of the non-standard buildings, that's your palaces and your tories, right. uh, you will also get a victory point. So... How that all works, you can really, really string together oh, yeah. a massive amount of points and a massive amount of money by building in the right location at the right time. Yeah, it sets up those real juicy turns that everyone likes that are super satisfying where you've worked it out and maximized about as many points as you can get from all those things Jeremy just said. Uh, the fourth phase. Yeah, the fourth phase, another simple one. This is where, like I said earlier, you're going to store one of your ships. So if you have a ship left over, you put it on your board. It has one spot for one ship. Again, if you have more than one ship, then you have to put it in this sort of wasted area over here. At the end of the game, for every two ships you've wasted that way, you're going to lose a victory point. And the last action you can take is uh, turning in the culture tokens yeah, that you, the that you acquired. Yeah, the culture tokens, this is how they work. Basically, as you collect the culture tokens, at the end of your turn, you can trade in any pair of the same color or any set of three of distinct different colors to acquire any one of the specialists. There's no extra purchasing no mm -hmm. money needs to be spent you just grab one of the specialists and from that point forward you're going to be able to use their power once per turn mm -hmm. they're also worth a variety of victory points again kind of like the fleet actions the ones that are worth a lot of victory points mm -hmm. one of them doesn't even have any powers he's yeah. just victory points That's right. and then there's some that have zero victory points but the powers might be a little juicier also needs to be noted that during this last step uh you can only acquire one specialist even if you had right. enough culture tokens to acquire more than that at the end of the round the turn order is going to be reordered according to which fleet tiles they took the fleet tiles that were taken are going to be shuffled face down you're going to slide over new ones and places at the end of the line so every single round you're going to get a different mixture of the tiles that could possibly come into play 
any of the specials that were taken are going to be refilled. Any of the ones that remained are going to have $2 placed on them, so they become a little bit juicier yeah. for the players. And then uh, you always have five uh, buildings that are available at the start of every round. You're not going to refill those, again, until the end of each round. Uh, and you're going to keep playing this round after round after round until one of four different things yeah, happen. Yeah, there's quite a few different ways to end the game. So uh, first thing is if any of the ships, uh, their supplies are gone, that signifies the end of the game. So if any, the, all the gold ships are gone or all the red ships and so forth. Um, if you can't refill the specialist row or if you can't refill the building row, that will also signify the end of the game. Uh, the last way to signify the end of the game is that if the last building from a player is built, you will continue around the table until everyone finishes that round. But at that point, the game will also be over. And as we said at the very beginning, the number of buildings that come into play are dependent upon the number of players. So I actually think you're going to start with 10 buildings in a two-player right. game versus six, six buildings in a four-player yeah. game. Uh, at the end of the game, you're going to tally up your victory points from the buildings that you have, from the money that you've collected, from any of the fans that you've collected, from building adjacent to your monuments or building on the mountains. You're going to lose victory points for mm -hmm. your extra ships that you have. And one of the tiles in here allows you to acquire... Um, one of the buildings and place it onto your side of the board, kind of a reserve to say, I'm going to build this. Yeah. Only I'm going to reserve this. If you aren't able to build that tile that you reserve, you're going to lose a victory point as well. Yeah. And then that's it. Tile right. up at the end, game over. Um, I'm going to play at Devil's Advocate on this, Go and I'll it. give you the things that I don't like about the game. Uh, and not many, it, by the way. No, it, it's it, it's not it's not going to be super harsh, but there's going to be a lot of comparisons from this to Five Tribes, which is Bruno's other game, a game that's on your top yep. ten of all time. Uh, Five Tribes suffers from a lot of AP, uh, and there's fair. things that can happen uh, between your turn and the next time it comes around to you. You're basically taking your turn as soon as it comes to you. You can't plan, plan ahead in, this game, in really. that game. The same thing happens in this game. Uh, this game, to me, is a fantastic two- and three-player game. It's still a very good four-player game, but you have far less control in the game in a four-player game than you do in a two and a three, especially a two. It's a fantastic two-player game. Yeah, what goes hand in hand with that, I think, too, is the fact that along with AP, sometimes when you're playing in a four-player game with players of different skill levels, uh, one player might benefit from having someone before them that plays poorly. Mm -hmm. um, so if you and I are vying for first place and you're going after someone who keeps setting you up for great moves, it can be a little bit frustrating yeah. at times. Now, with that said, in both Five Trabs and in this, you can manipulate the turn order so that's not exactly the case. Yeah. You know, you can change things up so you can distinctly position yourself, hopefully, yeah. in front of that other player so that you can sort of, you know, control their options yeah. or mess them up even. Yeah. Um, but with that said, to me, that is a very, very minor uh, issue. And in fact, I wouldn't even call it an issue. If we're looking for a con, that would be one. Uh, there's so much to love about this yeah. game. I love Five Tribes, and I promise I'm not just drinking Bruno's Kool-Aid mm -hmm. here. I, I really like Yamatai a lot. Uh -huh. A lot of people have asked us, because now that we, we've played it a few times, people are like, oh, is it is it pretty much like Five Tribes? This game is not Five Tribes at all mm -hmm. in terms of how it's played. With that said, there are a lot of elements that will remind you that are reminiscent of things you've seen in Five Tribes or yeah. maybe other Bruno games, in yeah. fact. Just like you'd see with any designer. Um but a lot of that comes through when you're playing it. Um, but it's not at all, oh, this is just another five tribes. Yeah. It seems like a, not a spiritual successor, but some sort of distant cousin. I, yeah, I agree for sure. I, I love this game. I, again, I don't want to sound like negative Nancy here, but <laughs> the, the truth is there's another issue I have with the game, and that is uh, this is a game that I have made a rule in the oh, game yeah. that you cannot rewind in this game. It's for this reason alone. There are car – there are uh, – fleet tiles in here that allow you to collect three. And then, of course, you can always buy an additional one. So that means you're going to be placing four, possibly four different fleet um, uh, ships onto the board. There's a lot of times in the game where you say, I'm placing this, I'm going to take this. I'm going to place this, I'm going to take this. I'm going to place this, I'm going to take this. And build and a building. And then I'm going to build a building. And you're like, oh, wait, I see a better action. Wait, which ones of these did I take? Uh, I'm just going to randomly put this one here, this one here, right. this one here, and take. Wait, where did I build my ships? That's a problem in this game. Yeah, it's and, definitely it definitely comes up a lot. Yeah, I mean, you really need to make it. Uh, uh, in my, in my opinion, you have to make a rule that once you've placed the ship, you're beholden to that action. Yeah, it, it would be wise to first of all when you're playing this for the first time with people, 
you're going to have to exhibit some patience for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because when people want to rewind, it's natural. You know, when you're learning a game, that, that happens. But like Jeremy said, it can be problematic because you start not realizing, like he said, where did this culture token go? Did I build this house this turn or this one? Yeah. So it can get a little cloudy. So it's like that old rule in chess. You know, once your finger leaves the piece, yeah. it's there. Yeah. That may be something you want to adopt for a game like this. Yeah. And again, I don't want to come down too harsh because in my no. opinion, I like this game better than Five Tribes. I really enjoy this as a two-player game. I've played it twice now as a two-player game. Also played it as three and a four-player game. And I think the aspects, a lot of the fleet tiles really come into use when you're playing it in a two-player game not as much in a four-player because it becomes a little more crowded even though the same amount of actions Mm -hmm. on the board it just feels like you can control more plus you get two actions every round as a two-player game compared to one action every round as a four-player so you have a lot more manipulation on the board you're allowed to do a lot more and you're allowed to pre-plan a little bit better than what you can in a three and four player game. yeah the two-player game has that one aspect that people either loved or didn't love so much about five tribes in a two-player game you can actually set up the turn order so that you're basically taking two turns in a row, potentially. Or even three in a two-player game. You could take right. the third, fourth, and, and then, then the, the first, first and the second, even. You could take four actions yeah. in a row Which if you set it up right. would be crazy. Yeah. So there's a lot of strategy that comes but into play. But that's super satisfying, because you can look at these buildings and say, I know I can build these two. If I take that really crappy tile there, I don't get a great action from it, but it means coming into the next round, I can fulfill that yeah. and that building and do that action and do that action and get culture and buy those specialists. Right. That's super satisfying in a two-player game. You don't have as much of that in a four-player game. Regardless, this is a fantastic game. Absolutely. Probably very high up on our list. I'm not sure what we're going to call it yet, approved or masterpiece, but it's a fantastic game by Bruno Catala. And I think first-time designer uh, Mark Paquin. Go check this one out as soon as it, as it hits in the retail. If you guys have any questions about the game, please make them in the comments below. Uh, we will answer those for you. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and everything else that we do here at Man vs. Meeple. And we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.